Act Two of The Mind the Paint Girl by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The scene is an artistically decorated refreshment saloon, or foyer, on the first circle floor of a theater. The wall facing the spectator is paneled partly in glass, and through the glazed panels the corridor behind the circle and the doors admitting to the circle are seen. The right-hand wall is paneled in a similar way, showing the landing at the top of the principal staircase and an entrance to the corridor. Some music stands and stools are on the landing, arranged for a small orchestra. In the right-hand wall there is a double swing door giving on to the landing, and in the wall at the back, opening on to and from the corridor, there is a single swing door on the left and another on the right. The left-hand door is fastened back into the saloon by a hook. Between the two doors in the back wall runs the refreshment counter. In one of the further corners of the saloon, there is a plaster statue representing the muse of comedy. In the opposite corner, a companion figure of dancing. In the wall on the left, the grate hidden by flowers, is a fireplace with a fender stool before it and on either side of the fireplace there is a capacious and richly upholstered armchair. A settee of like design stands against the wall on the right between the double door and the spectator. The counter is decked out as a sideboard, and at equal distances from each other there are four round tables laid for a supper party of twenty-six persons. There are eight chairs at one table and six at each of the others chairs being of the sort usually supplied by ball caterers. The saloon and the landing without are brilliantly lighted, the corridor less brightly. Luigi and four waiters, one of whom has a curly head and a fair beard ending in two flamboyant points, are putting the finishing touches on the laying of the tables, while Morris Cooling, a person of imposing presence, displaying a vast expanse of shirt front, is engaged in placing upon each of the serviettes a card bearing the name of a guest. Cooling referring to a plan of the tables which he has in his hand. Miss Conifee, Miss Conifee, Miss Conifee, where's Miss Conifee? Ah, here you are, my dear. Moving to Miss Conifee's chair and putting a card upon her serviette. Next to old Arthur. The four waiters obeying a direction in dumb show from Luigi go out at the door on the left. Luigi, a little dark active man, viewing the tables with satisfaction. Tables look nice, Mr. Cooling. Cooling absorbed. Not bad, not bad, not bad. Luigi follows the waiters. Miss Cato. Moving to another table and laying a card upon a serviette. Gabrielle. Roper bustles in through the double door in high feather. Hello. Cutting a caper. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and how are you tomorrow? Cooling deep in his plan of the tables. Hello, at Lau. Roper surveying the tables. Splendid. Going from one table to another. Seating em, hey? Mr. Park, Mr. Park, Mr. Park. Placing another card. Albert. Which do you make your principal table? There it is. You're at it. Ah, yes. Examining the cards. Miss Lily Paradell. His jaw falling. Why, you've gone and put the Baron on her right. Cooling unconsciously. Well, what's the objection? Where's Farkham? Where's Lord Farkham? On the other side, with Dolly Stidolf and Enid. Rats. What do you mean by rats? Advancing to the principal table, nettled. Look here, Lau. My dear fellow, Miss Paradell is the heroine of the party. The seat next to her is the seat of honour. That's why I put the Baron there, with things as they are between England and Germany. If Germany doesn't like it, she must lump it. Lord Farcombe's the eldest son of an earl. You can't get over that. Cooling picking up Farncombe's card. Oh, have it your own way. Roper picking up von Rittemeyer's card. Besides, the Baron's sweet on Enid just now. I'm sure he'd prefer... They exchange the cards and rearrange them. 
"'Thanks, old man. Sorry I was shirty.' Cooling, laying down his plan and cards, and producing a letter from his breast pocket. "'By the by, the fair lady, the heroine of the party, as you call her, is in a pretty tantrum over the whole business.' "'Tantrum?' Cooling, unfolding the letter. "'Had this from her ten minutes ago. Listen to this.' reading my dressing-room eleven fifteen eighty degrees with the windows open in an injured tone ha so i should think roper concerned what's amiss cooling reading more you pig roper whistles more you pig i should feel deeply indebted to you if you would kindly inform me why the devil you went out of your way to deceive me last night you led me to suppose and so did that lying worm lal roper looking at roper you oh lord that lying worm lal roper roper testily all right all right you both led me to suppose that this rotten banquet was to be a family gathering of the ladies and gentlemen of the pandora theatre and no outsiders asked now i find that only three or four of the men of the company are invited and i hear from nita trevenna who has got it from young kennedy that several of the boys are to be laid on for the occasion the result is you have made me tell a regular whopper to a particular friend of mine with regard to this affair roper passing his hand over his brow nico jays which i will never forgive you for morris schooling neither you nor lal roper as true as i am alive i have a jolly good mind not to show but to put on my old rags and go straight home you are too cad so take it out of that and believe me always yours affectionately lil roper walking about well i'm blessed cooling returning the letter to his pocket ha huh? tasty document lying worm in a cad and from miss livy margaret upjohn done anything about it no waited for you going on with his arrangements at the table you're responsible what i did last night was simply to oblige a pal roper irresolutely i'd better run round to her and try to smooth her down hadn't i perhaps you had placing a card mr stuart hennage to roper why you wanted to mislead the girl i can't understand damn it you agreed that that silly brute jays would be a wet blanket you blow hot and cold you do there you go more filthy temper if ever i assist in getting up another party as he reaches the door on the left he encounters carlton smythe who is entering at that moment and puts on his humorous manner hello here we are again all change for oxford circus smythe a bulky sleepy-looking man with grey hair a darker moustache and beard and a heavy rolling gait hello i'm just going to have a word with little paradell he disappears and smythe advances cooling approaching smythe how are you tonight chief smythe a silk hat on the back of his head an overcoat on his arm regarding the preparations with disgust Heh, is a muck in the muddle don't worry we'll clear it away in no time shall i tell you who are coming no i shall know soon enough what was the house to-night cooling producing a long slip of paper and handing it to smythe big smythe scans the paper through half-closed lids and gives a growl of contentment ah and the weather dead against us smythe screwing up the paper and cramming it into his waistcoat pocket there's no bad weather for a good play looking at his hands i'll go and have a wash and a brush up luigi returns entering at the door on the left and goes behind the counter the waiters follow him carrying some melons lying upon ice in plated dishes they deposit the dishes upon the counter and luigi proceeds to cut the melon into slices Cooling resumes at the table on the left the placing of the cards. As Smythe is moving towards the right-hand door at the back, Stuart Hinnage and Gerald Grimwood, two exquisitely dressed youths with blank faces, enter from the landing. Smythe shake hands with them. Ah, Mr. Hinnage, Mr. Grimwood. Hinnage and Grimwood murmur some polite expressions. 
Excuse me, I'm just going to wash my hands. De Castro enters also at the double door as Smythe shakes hands with him. Hennage and Grimwood drift over to Cooling, who hails them warmly. How do, Sam? Back in a moment, just going to wash my hands. De Castro detaining him. I say, Carlton. Eh? Huh? I've been in front again tonight. Magnificent. Marvelous. Smythe resignedly. Oh, it'll do. I shall get a couple of years out of it. There's just one little improvement I'd like to see, if I may suggest it. What's that? De Castro linking his arms in Smythe. You're sure you won't consider me presumptuous? Of course not. Very kind of you. De Castro is my seer. If you could give Gabth, uh, Miss Cato, a tiny bit more to do in the second act. Smythe nodding. Ah, uh, yes, yes. She's a little lump o talent, that gal. If you only realized it, a perfect little lump o talent. Smythe uh, trying to escape. Uh, I'll think it over. Will ya? An extra thong. That's all it need be, an extra thong. Oh, it would be such an improvement. Von Rittemeyer enters at the double door. The waiters now go to the tables and lay a plate with a slice of melon upon each cover. Ah, here's the Baron. We've been sitting together tonight, I and the Baron. Ringing Smythe's hand. Thanks. Joining Cooling and the others on the left, as Smythe greets von Reitemeyer. Hello, Morris. Shaking hands with Hennage and Grimwood. Well, boys. Smythe shaking hands with von Reitemeyer. Glad to see you, Baron. So good of you to half me. Excuse me, I'm just going to wash my hands. Von Reitemeyer detaining him. Pardon me. One moment. Eh? May I take the liberty of indulging in a little criticism on your excellent play? Certainly. Von Rettenmeyer drawing Smythe away from the tables. Come here. His mouth close to Smythe's ear. The second act. Second act? What's the matter with it? The part where the charming Miss Barada is changing a costume. Yes? That is where the beast requires lifting. With a gesture. Lifting. Lifting? Mr. Davish, Mr. Bog. Extremely clever. Slipping his arm through Smythe. But if you could see your way clear to give Enid, Miss Mongrief, another dance. A Smythe nodding. Ah, hmm, hmm. It would remove the solitary imperfection. Uh, I'll think it over. Releasing himself. I'm just going to wash my hands. We'll talk about it later. Schonsten Dank. Going to the man on the left. Aha, Mr. Gooling, my dear steward, my dear Jerry. As Smythe is again making for the door on the left, Mrs. Stidolf enters from the landing with Colonel Stidolf. Smythe to Mrs. Stiddle. Ah, Dolly! How are you, my dear? Mrs. Stiddle, a mature but still beautiful woman, gorgeously dressed and wearing showy jewels with a lofty air. How are you, Carlton? Smythe to Stiddle. How do you do, Arthur? Delighted to see you. Lucky I'm able to come to you tonight. It's so difficult to catch me in the season. Been in front? Mm, yes. Oh, yes. What? Don't you like it? Oh, I don't say I dislike it. Shrugging her shoulders. But one can't forget what one used to do here in the old days. Stidolf, an elderly, distinguished-looking man, with a meek voice and a courteous but rather nervous manner. I've had a most enjoyable evening, Colton. So bright... So very bright. Mrs. Stidolf to Stidolf, sneeringly. Oh, anything pleases you. You'd laugh at Punch and Judy. I'm just running away to wash my hands. 
looking towards the men on the left. You know von Rittenmeyer? Know him? Why, he was about in my time. Crossing to von Rittenmeyer, followed by Stidolf. Carl. My dear lady. Kissing her hand perfunctorily. What bliss. Shaking hands with Stidolf. Carl now. Mrs. Stidolf shaking hands with de Castro. How are you, Sam? Ah, Dolly. Hello, Arthur. Cooling presenting Hennage and Grimwood to the Stidolfs. Mr. Stuart Hennage, Mr. Gerald Grimwood. As a Stidolf leaves Smythe, Herbert Fulkerson enters from the landing with Farncombe. In dumb show, Smythe and Fulkerson greet each other, and then Fulkerson introduces Farncombe. Smythe shaking hands with Farncombe. Glad to make your acquaintance. Glad to make yours, Mr. Smythe, and in such circumstances. Fulkerson, a white-haired young man with red eyes of dissipated appearance, espying Mrs. Stiddolf. By Jove, if it is a dolly answer, hurrying to Mrs. Stiddolf. What cheer, dolly? Mrs. Stiddolf, coldly. How do you do, Mr. Fulkerson? Fulkerson is slightly abashed. Oh, I... I'm pretty middling, thanks. Hope you're the same. Nodding to Stidolf. Evening, Arthur. Vincent Bland has sauntered in at the door on the left and now joins the group surrounding the Stidolfs. Bland nodding to Hennage and Grimwood. Hello, Stuart. Hello, Jerry. Coming to the Stidolfs. Dolly. Colonel. Smythe to Farncombe. I'll be back in a minute or two. I'm just going to wash my hands. Fulkerson calling to Farncombe. Hi, Hetty! Farncombe crosses to Fulkerson and is presented by him to the Stiddles. Gabriel Cato enters at the right-hand door at the back, meeting Smythe as he is going out. The waiters have finished setting the plates of melon upon the tables and now withdraw, carrying the plated dishes and preceded by Luigi at the door on the left. Smythe to Gabrielle. Ah, Gabby, my dear. Quite well, huh? Gabrielle, a pretty young woman with a fretful little face, expressive of extreme dissatisfaction with the world, looking at Smythe spiritlessly. This is a treat. Why, you haven't been to see us for ages. Smythe uh, cunningly. I see you all far oftener than you suspect. Do you? That is sly of you. Smythe leaving her. I'm just going to have a wash and a brush up. Really? Oh, you are full of news. He departs as de Castro approaches Gabrielle. Hello, Gabth. How are you tonight? Oh, I'm all right, I suppose. Isn't it hot? De Castro not at ease with her. It ith inclined that way. Daphne Dürer, Nita Tavena, Douglas Glenn, and Albert Pock enter at the door on the left. Nita is a tall, handsome girl. Daphne a plump, little, fair, baby-faced thing. They are charmingly dressed, as are all the ladies of the Pandora Theatre. Glenn and Pock, the latter a short, thick-set man, who might reasonably be a low comedian, are two professional-looking gentlemen of the best class. The rivals are warmly hailed by Fulkerson, von Rettemeyer, Hinnage, and Grimwood, with more reserve by Mrs. Stidolf. Stidolf has seated himself wearily in the armchair on the nearer side of the fireplace, and beyond listening to Bland, who is talking to him, has withdrawn himself from the proceedings. Fulkerson to Farncombe. Here's Daphne Dure and Nita Trevena. Hello, Daphne. Hello, Nita. How are ya, Douglas? Hello, Albert. How do you do, How do you Bertie? do, Bertie? How do you do, Vaughn? Von Rettenmeyer kissing their hands. Dear ladies. Ah, Mr. Glynn, Mr. Bach. How do you do, Stewie? How do you do, Stewie? How do you do, How Jerry? Do you do, Jerry? How do you do, Jerry? Oh, Dolly. Oh, Dolly. That you, Dolly? Well, girls. Here. I want to introduce Lord Farncombe, Miss Dure, Miss Trevenor, Lord Farncombe, Douglas, Albert, Lord Farncombe. 
Nita pouncing upon cooling. I say, Morris. What is it, my dear? Is it true that little Kennedy's met with an accident? Yes, can't join us. The dwarf? What's happened? Ran his car into a bus just outside the theater. Oh. Pitched himself forward onto his head. His head? Don't be anxious, Nita. There's nothing to hurt there. Poor dwarf. Gabrielle and DeCastro now move over to the others. Hello, Gabs. Hello, Sam. Ah, Bertie. Von Rettenmeyer kissing Gabrielle's hand. Gabrielle. Ah, Von. To Hennage and Grimwood. Ah, boys. To Mrs. Stiddolf. How are you? The Castro shaking hands. Daphne, Nita, uh, Douglas, Albert. I want to introduce Lord Farncombe. Miss Cato, Lord Farncombe. A band of musicians have mustered upon the landing, and there is the sound of the tuning of instruments. Cooling hurrying across to the double door. No, no, no music yet. Wait for Miss Paradell. He reaches the double door. Roper enters quickly at the right-hand door, at the back, and seizes his arm. Eh? It's all right. She'll be round in a minute. Amiable? Angelic. She's wearing a new dress, and that's taken her mind off it. Her bark's always worse than her bite. I knew it'd blow over. Roper, formidably. Oh, but I have given her such a talking to. Gulleen passes through the double door and instructs the leader of the band while Roper bustles over to the throng on the left. Hello. Imitating a street news vendor. Special edition, Cricket Piper. Shaking hands all round. Dolly, Nita, Gabs, Daphne, Douglas, Albert. Ah, here you are, Farncom. Discovering Stidolf. Hello, Colonel. Results, Piper Extra Special. Enid Moncrief, Wilford Tavish, and Sigismund Shirley enter at the right-hand door at the back. Enid is a long, spare-figured girl with the lissome walk of a dancer. Tavish and Shirley are tall, clean-shaven men of gentlemanlike appearance. Von Rettenmeyer makes for Enid eagerly and is followed at a more moderate pace by Hennage, Grimwood, and de Castro, and by Fulkerson bringing Farncombe. Miss Moncrief kissing in his hand with fervor. Your dancing was more surprising tonight than ever. To Tavish and Shirley. Ah, my friends. Enid shaking hands with Hennage, Grimwood, and De Castro. Well, Stu, how are you, Jerry? Sam! I want to introduce Lord Farncom, Miss Moncrief, Lord Farncom. Roper hurrying across. Hello, here's Enid. De Castro shaking hands with Tavish and Shirley. Peace went splendidly this evening, didn't it? Fulkerson shaking hands with Tavish and Shirley. I want to introduce Lord Farncom, Mr. Tavish, Mr. Shirley, Lord Farncom. Enid coming forward to greet Mrs. Stiddolf, who advances to her. Dolly, dear! Mrs. Stiddolf embracing Enid. Enid, darling, good gracious, you're becoming an absolute skeleton. Indeed. Well, no one can say that of you. It is a pleasure meeting all you girls tonight. Of course, one can't help seeing changes. Ah, it must be a pleasure, that. I'm going to scold dear old Carlton by and by. He never gave me a birthday party when I was with him. No. And you had so many birthdays here, hadn't you? Cooling returns, entering from the landing, and after looking at the assembly, goes out at the right-hand door at the back. At the same moment, Flo Conifee, Sybil Dermot, Olga Cook, and Evangeline Ventress, four statuesque beauties with impassive faces, enter at the door on the left. Olga is in a dark gown, and Evangeline is wearing a rather elaborate headdress. Instantly, there is a movement in the direction of the new arrivals on the part of Roper, Hinnage, and Grimwood. De Castro and Fulkerson follow, Fulkerson still leading Farncombe about with him. Mrs. Stidolf turns from Enid, disdainfully, and joins Nita and Daphne at the fireplace. Tavish and Shirley also move to the left, 
where they come upon Stidolf and shake hands with him, while von Rettemeyer and Enid, the latter flushed with victory, seat themselves upon the settee on the right. Roper hastening to the beauties. Hello. Show your tickets, please. Room inside for four. Shaking hands. How are you, Flo? How are you, Sybil? How are you, Olga? I say, look at Vanji. The four beauties, as the men shake hands with them mechanically. How do you do? 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 Here, I want to introduce Lord Farncombe, Miss Conify, Lord Farncombe, Miss Dermot, Miss Cook, Miss Fanchy Fantress, Lord Farncombe. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Cooling hurries back. Cooling to everybody. Miss Paradell. Opening the door and signaling to the leader of the band. Now. The band strikes up the air of Mind the Paint, as Lily enters at the right-hand door at the back, with Jimmy Birch. Lily is dressed in white and altogether fulfills exteriorly Roper's description of angelic. She carries a large bouquet of lilies and pale roses, with a broad ribbon flowing from it. All the men but Farncombe, who holds aloof, press round her, Stidolf rising and joining them. The ladies follow. The men struggling for her hand. Many happy returns of the day. 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 Jimmy battling with the men. Keep away from her. Bertie, you're on her frock. Mind her frock. Mind the paint. Lily holding her bouquet above her head. My roses. Be careful of me, boys. One at a time. Many happy returns of the day. 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 Returns of the day. I want to kiss the girls. Girls. The men make way for the ladies to come to Lily. Many happy returns of the day. 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 Lily embracing them. Sybil, Nita, oh, Mrs. Sturdolf, Enid, Daphne, Gabs, Flo, dear, Olga, Fanji. Park suddenly. Here's the governor. Smythe enters at the door on the left. Luigi and the waiters are behind him, the waiters carrying trays on which are sugar casters and dishes of powdered ginger. At once there is a movement towards Smythe of everybody except those who have already greeted him, and Lily, who is detained by Roper and others. How are you, Governor? How do you do, Mr. Smythe? 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 How are you, Carlton? 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 Smythe in the midst of them all. Girls, girls, I'll shake hands with you all in turn, girls. Thought you were dead. Yes, look at Olga. She's deep in mourning. (laughs) (laughs) Smythe shaking hands. Don't, girls, don't. You're smothering me. Lily, during a momentary lull, finding Farncombe standing before her, and raising her eyebrows. You! Giving him her hand carelessly. Oh, it isn't long before we meet again, is it? Smythe, puffing and blowing. Ah, that's the lot of them. Phew, where's Lily? Lily here? The crowd divides to allow him to advance. Seeing Lily, he opens his arms, and she goes to him, and lays her head upon his breast. Lil! patting her shoulders. My dear. Lily half gaily, half tearfully. Ha, <laughs> Carlton. God bless you. Well, what about something to eat? Ready, Mr. Smythe. Ladies and gentlemen, supper is ready. Ha! Huh. Cooling at the principal table. Here you are, chief. 
Miss Paradell. Smythe to Lily. Come along. There is a general hunt for places and much hubbub and confusion. Cooling calling to Roper. Lau, that's your table. Roper imitating a shop walker. Mr. Roper, forward. Mrs. Stidolf, Lord Farncombe. Pointing to another table. Glenn, you're there. Here you are, Daphne. Miss Cato wanted. Gabs. Stewie. Baron. Enid. Ah. Cooling to Stidolf. Over there, Colonel. Volker said, wandering about. Where am I? Where am I? Nita, pushing him aside. Oh, be off. Jimmy. Cooling at his place at the table. Olga, you're here. Mr. Grimwood? Where am I? Next to me, worse luck. Screwing up her face at him. Oh. Ladies' mantles on the second floor. Where's Sybil? Sib! Sib! The curtain falls, but the music of Mind the Paint continues for a while. Then it ceases, and after a short silence the curtain rises again. The supper tables have disappeared, and the saloon is empty of people. The musicians and their music stands and stools have also gone, and faintly from the distance comes the sound of a waltz. Two settees matching the rest of the furniture now stand at the center of the saloon, back to back, one of them facing the counter, the other facing the spectator. Lily's bouquet lies in the nearer of the two settees, and upon the floor there is a fan a red rose that has fallen from the lady's corsage, and a pocket handkerchief with a powder puff peeping from it. On the counter there are carafes of lemonade, decanters of spirits, and siphons of soda water, a bowl of strawberries and cream, various dishes of cakes, boxes of cigars and cigarettes, a lighted spirit lamp, and other adjuncts of a buffet. Colonel Stidolf wanders in through the double door as the waltz comes to an end. Feebly and dejectedly he goes to the counter, takes a cigarette, and is lighting it, when Luigi and the waiters enter the door on the left. Two of the waiters are carrying bottles of champagne and wine coolers. Another brings a tray on which are champagne glasses and tumblers, and the bearded waiter follows with a large dish of sandwiches. Luigi behind the counter to Stidolf, familiarly. Ain't you dancing, Colonel? Dancing? I? Shaking his head. No. Luigi, who speaks Cockney English with a slight foreign accent, cutting the wire of a champagne bottle. Why, you used to be a regular slap-up dancing man when I first knew you. Stidolf nodding. Ah, uh, ah. Uh moving away my dancing days are done done oh i like that i bet you ain't sixty come now eh what's the time luigi i am got a watch on time colonel looking at his watch twenty to three no later sitting on the settee on the right with a sigh Oh, dear. One of the waiters goes out, in obedience to a direction from Luigi, at the door on the left, as Hinnage enters with Enid. Grimwood with Nita, von Rettemeyer with Mrs. Stidolf at the right-hand door at the back. A wisp of hair has fallen over Hinnage's forehead. Grimwood looks somewhat downcast, and von Rettemeyer is obviously bored by Mrs. Stidolf. Enid to Hinnage, walking across to the left been to ostend you've never been born then i'm counting the hours to my holiday sitting in the chair on the nearer side of the fireplace hotel de la plage why don't you run over while i'm there nita to grimwood following enid my dear boy i give you my solemn word it wasn't you it was that fool bertie anyhow it's a rotten old frock showing a small rent in her skirt to enid gaily Pom para, rom pom pom. Hennage and Grimwood go to the counter, secure a waiter, and return with him to Enid and Nita. The waiter receives his orders and presently fetches the ladies glasses of lemonade. 
Mrs. Diddle whispering to von Rittemeyer. Well, did you ever? Just fancy. Von Rittemeyer absently looking at Enid. I beg your pardon? Fancy those two girls walking into a room before us. Discovering the fan upon the floor. Oh, I do believe that's my fan. Von Rettemeyer restores the fan to Mrs. Diddle, as Roper and Gabrielle enter at the door on the left. Gabrielle to Roper, in a low, complaining voice. It's a shame of you. That's what it is. You went and put Lily Paradel into rubber and enabled her to make a bit. She told us so. Yes, but how long ago? That's not the point. The point is, it's always Lily Paradel with you. You never do anything for us other girls. She sits upon the nearest settee in the center, and she and Roper, he standing by her, continue their conversation. Mrs. Stiddolf to von Rittemeyer. No, thanks. I'm on a diet. Didn't you notice me at supper? Moving to the settee on the right. Let's sit. To Stiddolf. Oh, get up. Stiddolf rises quickly. Why aren't you dancing? If you don't dance, go home and put yourself to bed. You might, for all the good you're doing here. Stiddolf with a forced, painful laugh. Ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Von Rettemeyer as Mrs. Stiddolf seats herself. Plenty of room for you too, Carlo. No, no. I won't inconvenience you. He moves away, and von Rettemeyer sits beside Mrs. Stiddolf. The waiter, who has previously gone out, now returns at the door on the left with a tray of ices in paper cases. He goes to the counter for a supply of ice spoons, as Farncombe enters with Lily at the right-hand door at the back. Her cheeks are flushed, her eyes sparkling. Roper, all his attention suddenly directed to Lily and Farncombe. Here's Lil. Lily excitedly seizing Stidolf's hand. You're not dancing, Colonel Stidolf. Showing him her program. Dance with me. I'll make one of the others give up a dance for you. Stidolf going to the counter. No, no. I'm too old. Too old for dancing. I shall never be too old for dancing. Coming to the nearest settee in the center, picking up her bouquet and sitting beside Gabrielle. Ah. Roper to Farncombe, who follows Lily. Hello. Beaming. Jolly potty, hey, Farncombe? Farncombe boyishly. Lovely. To Lily. May I bring you some lemonade? An ice? Lily looking up at him. You may keep on bringing me ices till the music starts again. Farncombe leaves her. Gabby, wasn't that waltz delicious? Pock and Sybil enter at the door on the left. Sybil seats herself beside Nita on the fender stool, and Pock fetches her some refreshment. Gabrielle to Lily drearily. I say, Lil. What? How much did you make out of rubber last year through, Lal? Rubber? 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 Well, I don't know. To Roper. How much? Four fifty. There. I did my house up with it. Gave the job to young Charlie Ramsden, who's gone in for decorating. Yes, and blew the whole lot at one go. <laughs> Blewed it completely. <laughs> what does the blue sea whisper to me? Von Combe appears at her side with the waiter, carrying the ices. Isis? Roper leaving Gabrielle, and with his hands in his pockets, walking about exultingly. Isis, sweets, all chocolates, full piano score. Hello here! Yeah. <laughs> Glenn and Olga and De Castro and Evangeline have entered at the right-hand door at the back. Olga and Evangeline seat themselves upon the further settee in the center, and Glenn and De Castro summon a waiter to attend upon them. Shirley and Flo now enter at the door on the left and go to the counter. At the same moment, Smythe, Cooling, and Tavish enter at the right-hand door at the back, Smythe smoking a huge cigar. They also stand at the counter and are served with drinks by Luigi. 
Lily and Gabrielle having each taken an ice, the waiter with the ices moves away and offers his ices to the other ladies. Another waiter carries round a tray on which are a box of cigarettes and the spirit lamp, and the bearded waiter moves about with the dish of sandwiches. Some of the ladies light cigarettes, a few of the men take sandwiches. Cooling as he enters with Smythe and Tavish. Ha, 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 you're wonderful, chief. To Tavish. The chief's in great form, Willie. To Stiddolf. Colonel, listen to the chief. Mrs. Stiddolf to von Rettemeyer, confidentially. Of course, this is strictly between ourselves, though I almost hinted as much to Smith. But the fact is, the Pandora isn't in the least what it was, Carl. Nodding is what it was, my dear darling, and nobody. Mrs. Diddle fanning herself. I suppose he can't find the artists. That's it. If you don't have the artists... Shutting up her fan. You recollect my Polly Taggart in The Merry Milliner? Von Rittemeyer stifling a yawn. Charming. Charming. Von Combe is bending over Lily while she is eating her ice, and they are talking lightly but intently. Gabrielle, finding that she is out of it, rises with a pout and, carrying her plate, joins the ladies and men who are at the fireplace. Bland enters with Jimmy at the door on the left. Mrs. Stiddolf to von Rettemeyer. I hate blowing my own trumpet, but I was looking through my press cuttings only yesterday. I've never seen such notices as I had for Polly Taggart. Von Rettemeyer closing his eyes. Favorable? Favorable? <laughs> they make me blush to read them. Stupid of me, but they make me blush positively. Jimmy comes to Lily, Bland following her. On her way, she sees the handkerchief and powder puff lying upon the floor. Why, there it is. Picking up the handkerchief and puff and rubbing the puff, which is an extremely ragged one over her nose, singing sentimentally. There are no friends like the old friends, the constant tried and true. Sitting beside Lily. Room for a little un. Lily, without interrupting her talk with Barncombe, lays her hand on Jimmy's for a moment. Bland to Jimmy. Bring you anything? Jimmy wrapping the puff in the handkerchief tenderly and slipping it into her bosom. A liqueur of petrol and a lucifer match. Bland leaving her. Oh, go on. Mrs. Stiddolf to von Rettemeyer. And then to give it all up, as I was idiot enough to do when I married. <sighs> and for a life as dull as ditch water, if ever a woman sacrificed herself in this world. Fulkerson and Daphne enter at the door on the left and hurry to the counter. Fulkerson boisterously. Time! Time! To those standing at the counter. Hello, me, hello, me. To Luigi. Glass of lemonade and the whiskey and soda. Quick with the whiskey and soda. Mrs. Stiddolf to von Rettemeyer. But I don't intend to stick to that arrangement. If I can't get back into the theaters, there are halls. I was telling the colonel this morning. Roper appearing before Mrs. Stiddolf, his program in his hand. Ours, Dolly. Von Rettemeyer, rising with alacrity. Ah! Bowing to Mrs. Stiddolf. I yield with reluctance. Roper sits beside Mrs. Stiddolf, and Von Rettemeyer hastens to Eden. Roper to Mrs. Stiddolf. Another waltz. Daphne to Hennage, who is claiming her. Wait till I've finished my drinks, Dewey. Land to Nita. Nita? No, this is with Douglas. Nothing of the sort. Nita referring to her program. You're correct. My mistake. De Castro coming to Gabrielle, who is talking to Sybil. Gapth. Oh, you again. De Castro mortified. Afraid, though. The sound of distant music is again heard, and there is a great deal of bustle as the men claim their partners. Tavish goes to Evangeline, Grimwood to Flo, Falk and Glenn to Olga and Sybil, and gradually the assemblage melts away. 
Fulkerson coming to Jimmy, who is carrying her program and standing before her, reading from his program. Volskrydike. Jimmy with withering accuracy. Vals cri de coeur. Fulkerson wagging his head. Very likely. Come along, Jimmy. Jimmy rising and shaking herself out. Jane to you, if you please. Tosh. I was christened Jane, Herbert. Well, I wasn't at a christening, see? No. But if you are not more careful of those feet of yours while you're waltzing, you will be at my funeral. She takes his arm and they go out at the door on the left. Smythe, Stidolf, Cooling, and Shirley follow talking together. All the couples have now disappeared except von Rettemeyer and Enid and Farncombe and Lily. Von Rettemeyer and Enid are at the counter, where Luigi is giving von Rettemeyer a glass of champagne, and the waiters are busying themselves in collecting the soiled glasses, plates, etc., which have been left upon the mantelpiece and chairs. The bearded waiter comes to Lily, and she hands him her plate. Farncombe to Lily. Shall we go down? She rises, leaving her bouquet upon the settee, and is about to put her arm through Farncombe's, when she checks herself and looks at her program. Lily frowning. Eh? One, two, three, four. Why, this is our fifth dance. Yes. Five out of eight. Farncombe looking at his program. And ten, twelve, and fourteen are mine, too. Lily with a movement of her shoulders, accepting his arm. How unfair. Farncombe, as they go to the right-hand door at the back. Unfair? To the others. I can't think what made me so thoughtless. They disappear. Two of the waiters carrying out the soil glasses, etc. Another follows with the ices. And the bearded waiter with the strawberries and cream. After a while, Luigi also withdraws. Enid leaving the counter with von Rettemeyer. Well, what did you say to him? I told him the bees wants lifting in the second act, and that he ought to give you another dance. What did he say? He will think it over. Ha! Huh, that's Smythe's invariable formula, cunning old fox. But we are to talk about it later. I am waiting to get him alone. <laughs> you won't get him alone, you stupid. He'll take precious good care of that. Finding that Luigi and the waiters have departed, and walking across to the left. Ah, oh, but it isn't dancing my mind's dwelling on just now, dear boy. Von Rettemeyer following her. Not. It's rest I'm yearning for. My holiday. Rest for my weary bones. Turning to him without a sign of disturbance. Carl, I'm simply bursting with rage. Rage? That wretched hotel at Ostend, the Plage. They have the confounded impudence to ask me a hundred and twenty-five francs a day for two cubbyholes on the third floor for my aunt and me. Monstrous. With a shrug. But Ostend is... Ostend. Thanks for the information. Is that all the sympathy you can offer? Pardon. There may be keeper orders. Where the common people pay for their beds and meals with cook's coupons. Sitting upon the arm of the further settee in the centre and swinging her feet. Oh, it doesn't matter. I suppose it'll have to be a swanage, or some brisk resort of that description. Oh, so be it. Tra-la-la-la-la. Von Rettemeyer sitting on the nearer settee in the centre, close to her, with an anxious expression. A hundred and twenty-five francs a day? Including nothing. Absolutely nothing. Von Rettemeyer biting his nails. Precisely. There's the eating and drinking. One can't starve, that's certain. Which would amount to... Enid watching him out of the corner of her eye. I believe Aunt and I could manage to feed ourselves on forty francs a day, or fifty, at a pinch. Von Rettemeyer, his face growing longer and longer. A hundred and twenty-five and fifty. A hundred and seventy-five. Stroking his hair with a finger. Call it two hundred. 
von rettemeyer leaning back appalled fifty zigs pounds a week sixty in round figures for a fortnight oh no dear a fortnight's no use but one becomes sick of a place after a fortnight if you only go for enjoyment not if you go for rest rest three weeks then a month smythe gives me the whole of august von rettemeyer passing his hand across his forehead a month enid rising and carefully picking a piece of fluff from her skirt we're losing this dance shall we have a turn he gets to his feet with some difficulty and then faces her von rettemeyer breathing heavily enid enid guilelessly yes von rettemeyer putting his heels together and bowing to her if you would permit me to be your banker during your stay at ostend four weeks carl i should be most gratified enid going to him i couldn't such an obligation von rettemeyer bowing again on my side enid giving him her hands of course i defray my travelling expenses and tips and incidentals von rettemeyer raising her hands to his lips ah not a penny of those should fall on you withdrawing her hands quickly and backing away from him Ish. stidolf enters at the door on the left and again wanders to the counter stidolf taking another cigarette you're missing a very pretty waltz miss moncrief enid going to the door on the left von rettemeyer following her i was just saying so to the baron enid and von rettemeyer disappear stidolf lights his cigarette and is leaving the counter when gabrielle and de castro enter at the right-hand door at the back de castro looking exceedingly sulky stidolf to gabrielle and de castro ah oh, miss cato ah oh, sam a pleasant party eh yes stidolf goes out at the right-hand door at the back de castro crosses to the left and then turns to gabrielle damn pleasant party well don't make a scene theme i'm not making a theme walking away from me in the middle of a dance and leaving me standing staring after you like a deserted child you're making the scene i am very sorry i'm just as good a waltzer as any one here and better than most waving his arms if you're tired of me announce the fact quietly don't go and wipe your boots on me in public because that hurts my pride gabrielle with a little twist of her body i can't do more than apologize first time i've ever done that to a man the castro coming to her mollified i don't ask it gaps i don't ask it all i ask gabrielle sitting on the nearest settee in the centre if i'm rude it's owing to my low spirits i'm so shockingly low-spirited i know you are and i make allowances for your i repeat all i ask gabrielle gazing at vacancy mine is a strange nature on the stage i am liveliness itself a perfect little lump of talent i've been telling carlton so persuading him to introduce an extra song for you in act two gabrielle looking at de castro you have yes did he promise to think it over his exact words <laughs> resuming her former attitude as i was remarking i am a mass of inconsistency on the stage the embodiment of elfish fun that was in the mail gabrielle nodding in the mail off the stage i am a sufferer from what's called the artistic temperature no temperament the castro uncomfortably patting her shoulder oh poor little girl poor little girl gabrielle her melancholy increasing sometimes 
I've an idea that if I had a motor car of my own, I should feel easier and happier. What do you mean? A motor car of your own? Mine's always at your disposal, isn't it? Gabrielle shaking her head. That's not the same thing. Whenever I have yours out, I am weighed down by a sense of borrowing. Well, if I gave you a new car, you'd be weighed down by a sense of my having paid for it. At first I should, but not for long. Seeing my family crest on the door panels instead of your monogram would help me to forget you'd had anything to do with it. Gloomily. Of course, it would be only an experiment. It might cheer me up, or it mightn't. The music ceases. A waiter carrying a tray enters at the door on the left, goes behind the counter and mixes some drinks. The Castro, after a pause, loosening his collar in a low voice. Here, we'd better discuss this experiment glancing over his shoulder at the waiter. Let's come and sit in the pit. Gabrielle rising. I can't argue. My head is too bad for that. De Castro leading her to the double door. I don't want to argue. I simply want to arrive at an understanding. Supposing I buy you a car, am I to be made an ass of at the next dance we happen to meet at? Yes or no. They go out onto the landing and disappear as Fulkerson hurries in at the right-hand door at the back. His eyes are rather glassy and his utterance is a little thick. Fulkerson to the waiter, joining him behind the counter. Hi, wake up there. Guess it's a word of Miss Pearson's stage. Miss Pearson's stage gets a word with her. I'd have a whiskey. What's a whiskey? Wh which is the whiskey thing? Pouring some whiskey into a tumbler. You took soda water with Miss Bitch. I mix my own whiskey. Loose chops of soda water, Miss Bitch. The waiter goes out with the drinks, and Fulkerson, glass in hand, comes to the nearer side of the counter. He swallows his drink greedily singing to himself between the gulps. Oh, the girls, oh, the girls, I will fully fun of the girls. Putting his empty glass upon the counter and making for the door on the left. Be there by the blood of the girls I'm fond. I'm dreadfully fond of the girls. He vanishes as Farncombe and Lily enter at the right-hand door at the back. There is an air of constraint and uneasiness about the girl. She comes to the nearer settee in the center and again picks up her bouquet. Farncombe follows her. They talk in subdued voices and with frequent pauses. Another ice. Lily rearranging a rose. No, thanks. I... I wish I had given you a bouquet instead of a big, ugly basket. Why? You... You might have brought it to the theatre, as you have that one, and carried it about with you. I didn't bring this to the theatre. No? I found it with a lot of other flowers at the stage door. It's from the gallery boys. Looking at him for a moment steadily. And I attach some value to it. The bearded waiter enters at the right-hand door at the back, takes a box of cigars from the counter, and goes out at the door on the left. Lily walks away from Farncombe and seats herself upon the further settee in the center. Farncombe, as the waiter has withdrawn, producing his program. Number nine. Two-step. Mind the paint. To Lily. Of course, you... you are engaged for this. And you, surely? No, I... I kept it open in case... in case... I dance it with Maury. Mr. Cooling? Maury Cooling. Farncombe, after another pause, sitting behind her upon the nearer settee. Miss Parada. Well? I wonder whether Mr. Cooling would let you off. 
I shouldn't dream of asking him. No, but may I? I beg you'll do nothing of the sort. Forgive me. There is a further pause, and then she turns to him. Why I spoke so, so sharply to you was... <laughs> you didn't speak sharply to me. Was because I've been very nasty with Maury, wrote him a furious letter, and I want to make it up to him. Ah, uh, yes. I called him a pig and other things. I hate myself for it. A pig? Lily smiling. Still, that's no reason why I should be nasty with you. And call me a pig. Lily impulsively kneeling upon the settee so that she may compare her program with his. Look here. Fifteen. The last but one. Are you fixed up for fifteen? No. No? I kept it open. In case. Ha <laughs> ha! Ejecting herself severely. I might be able to give you fifteen. Farncombe scribbles on his program eagerly. Don't count on it, please. But it's book to Mr. Fulkerson, and Bertie's not always to be depended upon at that hour. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She resumes her seat, and he jumps up and goes to her. That reminds me. May I ask who is going to see you home, Miss Paradell? See me home? It would be an honour that I should appreciate, more than I can, find words to express. Lily, rising, sternly. I am very much obliged to you. Walking away from him again. I dare say Mr. Roper will see me home, and Mr. De Castro, and Mr. Bland. Farncombe following her unhappily. I... I, I hope... I... I hope I haven't offended you. Not in the least. Only I am in the habit of relying on old friends for those little services. Stidolf enters from the landing and again wanders to the counter and to the cigarettes. The bind the paint air to the time of a two-step is played in the distance. Farncombe bowing to Lily slightly and drawing himself up. Shall I take you to Mr. Cooling? Lily, with dignity, inclining her head. Will you? She is putting her hand through his arm when the look upon his face softens her. She drops her voice to a whisper. Have I hurt you? Oh, uh, I deserve the rebuke. No, you don't. Gently. You may leave me at my door with the others, if it will give you any satisfaction. As they walk to the door on the left, they are met by Cooling. Cooling to Lily, breathlessly. How ah, here you are. Lily leaving Farncombe, her manner altering completely. Come on, Maury. Her feet moving to the music. Tra-la-la, tra-la-la. Giving her bouquet to Farncombe. Hi. Bring my flowers. Tra-la-la, tra-la-la. Tra they run out, half-dancing. Stidolf calling to Farncombe, who is following them. Lord Farncombe? Yes. Stidolf going to him. Will you spare me a moment? Farncombe, a little impatiently. Uh, certainly. Stidolf laying a shaking hand on Farncombe's arm and leading him away from the door. Excuse me for what I'm going to say to you. I, I know your father, knew him very well years ago, and your mother. With deep feeling. My boy, my dear boy. Farncombe surprised. Colonel? I, I, I'm sorry to find you in this set. What do you mean? Don't be angry with me. I'm an old man. And an old fool. But it's from the fools that the useful lessons are to be learnt. Farncombe withdrawing his arm from Stidolf. I really don't understand you. Try to. Not now, at another time. When this music isn't exciting you, nor these pretty women. Think it out by yourself. 
you're at the beginning of your career, my boy. Remember me, the, the, the old fool who brought his to a miserable end, and that I cautioned you, cautioned you. Luigi hurries in at the door on the left, followed by a waiter carrying a tray, and by the waiter with the beard. <laughs> Behind the counter preparing drinks. Look out, gentlemen. You are losing it all. They are having a romp, a fine luck. Barncombe goes out at the door on the left. Make haste, colonel. Make haste. Stidoff goes out slowly at the right-hand door at the back. Whisk and soda for Mr. Tavish. Liqueur of brandy, Mr. Grimwood. The waiter carrying the tray goes out with the drinks at the door on the left. Ha, ha, ha. Tra-la-la, tra-la-la. Luigi is following the waiter who has carried out the tray when the bearded waiter, coming to the nearer settee in the center, sitting upon the settee, calls to him gruffly. Luigi? Luigi halting. Eh? The bearded waiter taking out a handful of money and selecting some gold from it. Here. Putting the gold into Luigi's palm. For your chaps. Oh, you are spoiling them. The bearded waiter giving some more gold pieces to Luigi. For you. Luigi bowing low. Thank you very much. With a polite grin as he disposes of the coins in different pockets. Hope you have enjoyed yourself, Captain. The bearded waiter, speaking in the voice of G's. Thoroughly. Quietly, between his teeth. Warm work, though. Rising slowly like a man with stiff joints. I'll be off now, with your permission. See you at lunch, Captain? Probably. Nodding. Good night. Good morning. He slouches away to the door on the left, and there stops listening. There is the sound of people approaching, singing uproariously and shouting and laughing. Hello. Luigi at his elbow. Ho, 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 ho. Luigi goes out into the corridor, and Jeeves retreats behind the counter. The noise increases, and presently Fulkerson rushes in, flourishing his arms madly. He is followed by Glenn and Shirley, who are carrying Lily upon their interlocked hands, and by Pock, who is helping to support her. Then come Hennage and Nita, Grimwood and Daphne, Tavish and Flo, Von Rettemeyer and Enid, De Castro and Gabrielle, Roper and Mrs. Stiddle, Farncombe and Jimmy, Bland and Evangeline, Cooling and Sybil, and Smythe and Olga, singing the chorus of the Mind the Paint song, and dancing to it wildly. They circle the saloon twice, go out at the right-hand door at the back return at the door on the left, and finally disappear through the double door and along the landing. The waiters who have brought up the rear of the procession gather with Luigi in the left-hand corner, clapping their hands, and Stidolf returns, entering at the right-hand door at the back. Lily waving her bouquet and shrieking with laughter. <laughs> Don't drop me! <laughs> Hinage <laughs> and Grimwood yelling. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Fulkerson deliriously endeavoring to stand upon his head. Whoop. Jimmy breaking from the rank and jumping on to the further settee. Mind the paint, mind the paint. A girl is not a sinner just because she's not a saint. <laughs> you drop me. <laughs> As the procession passes out of sight, followed by Luigi and the waiters, Jeeves departs at the door on the left, and Stidolf once more goes to the counter and lights a cigarette. End of Act Two